Dialogue of Comfort Against Tribulation by St. Thomas More Book 2 Vincent It is no little comfort to me, good uncle, that as I came in here I heard from your folk that since my last being here you have had meetly good rest, God be thanked, and your stomach somewhat more come to you. For verily, albeit I had heard before that, in respect of the great pain that for a month's space had held you, you were a little before my last coming to you, somewhat eased and relieved. For otherwise would I not for any good cause have put you to the pain of talking so much as you then did. Yet, after my departing from you, remembering how long we tarried together, and that we were all that while talking, and that all the labor was yours, in talking so long together without interposing between, and that of matter studious and displeasant, all of disease and sickness and other pain and tribulation, I was in good faith very sorry, and not a little wroth with myself for mine own oversight, that I had so little considered your pain. And very feared I was, till I heard otherwise, lest you should have waxed weaker and more sick thereafter. But now I thank our Lord, who hath sent the contrary. For a little casting back, in this great age of yours, would be no little danger and peril. Anthony Nay, nay, good cousin, to talk much, unless some other pain hinder me, is to me little grief. A foolish old man is often as full of words as a woman. It is, you know, as some poets paint us, all the joy of an old fool's life to sit well and warm with a cup and a roasted crab-apple, and drivel and drink and talk. But in earnest, cousin, our talking was to me great comfort, and nothing displeasing at all. For though we commoned of sorrow and heaviness, yet the thing we chiefly thought upon was not the tribulation itself, but the comfort that may grow thereon. And therefore am I now very glad that you are come to finish up the rest. Of truth, my good uncle, it was comforting to me, and hath been since to some other of your friends. Uh, to whom, as my poor wit and remembrance would serve me, I did report and rehearse, and not needlessly, your most comforting counsel. And now come I for the rest, and am very joyful that I find you so well refreshed and so ready thereto. But this one thing, my good uncle, I beseech you heartily. If I, for delight to hear you speak in the matter, forget myself and you both, and put you to too much pain. Remember your own ease, and when you wish to leave off, command me to go my way and seek some other time. Forsooth, cousin, if a man were very weak, many words spoken, as you said right now, without interposing would peradventure at length somewhat weary him, and therefore wished I the last time after you were gone, when I felt myself, to say the truth, even a little weary, that I had not so told you a long tale alone, but that we had more often interchanged words, and parted the talking between us, with more often interparling upon your part, in such manner as learned men use between the persons whom they devise, disputing in their feigned dialogues. But yet in that point I soon excused you, and laid the lack where I found it, and that was even upon mine own neck. For I remembered that between you and me it fared as it did once between a nun and her brother. Very virtuous was this lady, and of a very virtuous place and enclosed religion. And therein had she been long, in all which time she had never seen her brother, who was likewise very virtuous too, and had been far off at a university, 
and had there taken the degree of Doctor of Divinity. When he was come home, he went to see his sister, as one who highly rejoiced in her virtue. So came she to the great that they call, I believe, the locutory, and after their holy watchword spoken on both sides, after the manner used in that place, each took the other by the tip of the finger, for no hand could be shaken through the grate. And forthwith my lady began to give her brother a sermon of the wretchedness of this world, and frailty of the flesh, and the subtle slights of the wicked fiend, and gave him surely good counsel, saving somewhat too long, how he should be well wary in his living, and master well his body for the saving of his soul. And yet, ere her own tale came to an end, she began to find a little fault with him, and said, in good faith, brother, I do somewhat marvel that you, who have been at learning so long, and are a doctor, and so learned in the law of God, do not now at our meeting, since we meet so seldom, to me, who am your sister and a simple unlearned soul, give of your charity some fruitful exhortation, for I doubt not that you can say some good thing yourself. "'By my troth, good sister,' quoth her brother, "'I cannot for you, "'for your tongue hath never ceased "'but said enough for us both.' "'And so, cousin, "'I remember that when I was once fallen in, "'I left you little space to say aught between. "'But now will I therefore take another way with you, "'for of our talking I shall drive you to the one half. Now, forsooth, uncle, this was a merry tale. But now, if you make me talk the one half, then shall you be contented far otherwise than was of late a kinswoman of your own. But which one I will not tell you. Guess her if you can. Her husband had much pleasure in the manner and behavior of another honest man, and kept him therefore much company, so that he was at his meal-time the more often away from home. So happed it one time that his wife and he together dined or supped with that neighbour of theirs, and then she made a merry quarrel with him for making her husband so good cheer outside that she could not keep him at home. <laughs> Forsooth, mistress, quoth he, for he was a dry merry man, in my company no thing keepeth him but one. Serve him with the same, and he will never be away from you. What gay thing may that be? quoth our cousin then. Forsooth, mistress, quoth he, your husband loveth well to talk, and when he sitteth with me I let him have all the words. All the words? quoth she. Mary, then am I well content. He shall have all the words with good will, as he hath ever had. But I can speak them all myself, and give them all to him. And for aught I care for them, so shall he have them all. But otherwise to say that he shall have them all, you shall keep him still, rather than he get the half. Forsooth, cousin, I can soon guess which of our kin she was. I wish we had none for all her merry words, who would let their husbands talk less. Forsooth, she is not so merry, but what she is equally good. But where you find fault, uncle, that I speak not enough, I was in good faith ashamed that I spoke so much, and moved you such questions as, I found upon your answer, might better have been spared, they were of so little worth. But now, since I see you be so well content that I shall not forbear boldly to show my folly, I will be no more so shamefast, but will ask you what I like. Chapter 1 And first, good uncle, ere we proceed further, I will be bold to move you one thing more of that which we talked of when I was here before. 
For when I revolved in my mind again the things that were concluded here by you, methought you would in no wise wish that in any tribulation men should seek for comfort in either worldly things or fleshly. And this opinion of yours, uncle, seemeth somewhat hard, for a merry tale with a friend refresheth the man much, and without any harm delighteth his mind and amendeth his courage and his stomach, so that it seemeth but well done to take such recreation. And Solomon saith, I believe, that men should in heaviness give the sorry man wine to make him forget his sorrow. And St. Thomas saith that proper pleasant talking, which is called eutropelia, is a good virtue, serving to refresh the mind and make it quick and eager to labor and study again, whereas continual fatigue would make it dull and deadly. Cousin, I forgot not that point, but I longed not much to touch it, for neither might I well utterly forbear it, where it might befall that it should not hurt, and, on the other hand, if it should so befall, methought that it should little need to give any man counsel to it. Folk are prone enough to such fancies of their own mind. You may see this by ourselves, who, coming now together to talk of an as earnest sad matter as men can devise, were fallen yet, even at the first, into wanton idle tales. And of truth, cousin, as you know very well, I myself am by nature even half a gigolot and more. I wish I could as easily mend my fault as I well know it, but scant can I refrain it, as old a fool as I am. Howbeit, I will not be so partial to my fault as to praise it. But, since you ask my mind in the matter as to whether men in tribulation may not lawfully seek recreation and comfort themselves with some honest mirth, first agreed that our chief comfort must be in God, and that with Him we must begin, and with Him continue, and with Him end also, that a man should take now and then some honest worldly mirth, I dare not be so sore as utterly to forbid it. For good men and well-learned have in some cases allowed it, especially for the diversity of diverse men's minds. Otherwise, if we were also such as would God we were, and such as natural wisdom would that we should be, and is not clean excusable that we be not indeed, I would then put no doubt but that unto any man the most comforting talking that could be would be to hear of heaven. Whereas now, God help us, our wretchedness is such that in talking a while of it men wax almost weary, and as though to hear of heaven were a heavy burden, they must refresh themselves afterwards with a foolish tale. Our affection toward heavenly joys waxeth wonderfully cold. If dread of hell were as far gone, very few would fear God. But that yet sticketh a little in our stomachs. Mark me, cousin, at the sermon, and commonly toward the end, somewhat the preacher speaketh of hell and heaven. Now while he preacheth of the pains of hell, still they stay and give him the hearing. But as soon as he cometh to the joys of heaven, they are busking them backward, and flock meal fall away. It is in the soul somewhat as it is in the body. There are some who are come, either by nature or by evil custom, to that point where a worse thing sometimes more steadeth them than a better. Some men, if they be sick, can away with no wholesome meat, nor no medicine can go down with them, unless it be tempered for their fancy with something that maketh the meat or the medicine less wholesome than it should be. 
and yet, while it will be no better, we must let them have it so. Cassian, that very virtuous man, rehearseth in a certain conference of his, that a certain holy father, in making of a sermon, spoke of heaven and heavenly things so celestially, that much of his audience, with the sweet sound of it, began to forget all the world, and fall asleep. When the father beheld this, he dissembled their sleeping, and suddenly said to them, I shall tell you a merry tale. At that word they lifted up their heads and hearkened unto that, and afterwards, their sleep being therewith broken, heard him tell on of heaven again. In what wise that good father rebuked then their untoward minds, so dull to the thing that all our life we labor for, and so quick and eager toward other trifles. I neither bear in mind, nor shall here need to rehearse. But thus much of that matter sufficeth for our purpose. That whereas you demand of me, whether in tribulation men may not sometimes refresh themselves with worldly mirth and recreation, I can only say that he who cannot long endure to hold up his head and hear talking of heaven, unless he be now and then between refreshed, as though heaven were heaviness, with a merry foolish tale, there is none other remedy, but you must let him have it. Better would I wish it, but I cannot help it. Howbeit, by mine advice, let us at least make those kinds of recreation as short and as seldom as we can. Let them serve us but for sauce, and make themselves not our meat. And let us pray unto God, and all our good friends for us, that we may feel such a savour in the delight of heaven, that in respect of the talking of its joys, all worldly recreation may be but a grief to think on. And be sure, cousin, that if we might once purchase the grace to come to that point, we never found of worldly recreation so much comfort in a year as we should find in the bethinking us of heaven for less than half an hour. In faith, uncle, I can well agree to this. And I pray God bring us once to take such a savour in it. And surely, as you began the other day, by faith must we come to it, and to faith by prayer. But now, I pray you, good uncle, vouchsafe to proceed in our principal matter. End of chapter 1